one for the one and only DNVR. Two goes out to Zach May, Sarke at the bar. Three for Mr. B in that old trophy case. None for we're still waiting for. We'll bring on the chase. Out on the field, mile high, Broncos win is our desire. Couple with brick, brew and a friend bleed orange and blue to the bitter end. Come and join us, DDNVR. We are DNVR. Welcome, welcome, welcome into the DNVR Broncos podcast on this weekend edition of the show. I'm your host, Zach Stevens, joined by my special guest, Justin Michael. What is up, my friend? I'm feeling big time, man. First time on the Broncos podcast. I I feel like I'm part of the family now. Oh, you've always been part of the family. And man, you got some sweet swag as well. Oh, man, it's even Breck Brew swag. Got to shout out the partners at all points. Yeah, you know? that, Company that, can't, man. that can't get any better. Love the hat as well. And speaking of hats, man, we're getting a little preview of some new hats here at DNVR. They are sweet. But before we hop into, man, a fiery show, a fun show, bouncing back from yesterday's performance of kind of, you know, shooting it how it is. Today, we're going to have some fun stuff. I first got to tell you about our presenting sponsor, MSU Denver Online. And over at MSU Denver Online, they put a dynamic education at your fingertips without forcing you to decide between earning a degree and living your life. You can do it both over there at MSU and continue to get the same degree online when you live your life. So make sure to check them out because they've got everything going on over there, over at MSU Denver Online. My boy, Justin, so pumped to be joined by with, with you today. And man, like I said, a fiery practice today. You were out at Broncos practice with me. And you got to see the Broncos' first fight break out at training camp. Honestly, it, it was good to see, just especially after listening to the podcast throughout the week and, you know, RK especially yesterday, you know, just kind of being like, man, this team has no energy. They have yeah. no life. And for a little bit, I was starting to kind of see what he was talking about. The first, oh, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, I was like, this is kind of boring, not yep. seeing a lot of energy. And then Garrett Bowles and Bradley Chubb, two of the, you know, debatably the the biggest leaders on the teams get into it in a non-padded practice. So mm -hmm. you can tell, you know, there's a little bit of chippiness there. And honestly, I'm okay with it. Like you don't want your two superstars, you know, potentially getting injured, especially before the season starts. But this is a team that should be playing with a chip on their shoulders right now. And I kind of like seeing it. Yeah, I did too, especially from those two guys, you know, big names of the team. Now, Vic after practice wanted nothing to do with it. I wasn't going to be, I, I was, wouldn't have been surprised if Vic after practice says, you know, I don't want to fight. I don't want anyone to get hurt, but I did like seeing the passion. No, none of that. I mean, he, he said, never is it okay to fight. So he, even though he's old school, he doesn't like that. But here's how I kind of saw it. The, the fight start, and it started with the very first play of practice, which was not when the fight broke out. The first play of practice, Bradley Chubb uh, kind of beat Garrett Bowles a little bit. Uh, not not Bowles, but he got on a stunt and batted a pass down, batted Drew's first pass of the day down at the line of scrimmage, almost actually picked it off just because of like how in position he was. Then two plays later, Bradley Chubb gets the best of Garrett Bowles, go on the outside of him, and I think that's when Garrett Bowles got a little upset at what was going on. And that's, I didn't see anything then, but I think that's where it started. And then a couple of periods later is when the fight broke out. And all I saw was, I saw just right after a play, Garrett Bowles just kind of like on someone and laying on someone with just a bunch of guys standing around him. And it happened to be him and Bradley Chubb on the ground. And then, you know, everyone got in and kind of pulled it apart. It didn't turn into like a huge brawl between everyone. But did you see anything else about how it started? Just kind of what you said there, the, the kind of sequence, sequence of events. I, I noticed that Bradley beat him a couple of times and mm -hmm. it just seemed like he got under his skin. You know, I yeah. don't know if he was talking to him which, and, you know, it happens. It's mm -hmm. football practice. It's natural. I am a little surprised at how heated they got. It was one of those where it looked like even once they got separated, Bradley threw another little shove in there. Yep. You know, Garrett left the field obviously for a while, threw his helmet, you know, when he got over to the, the team area. Yep. I don't know though. Like I, 
I don't want to glorify it, but it got me do, interested. Though. You know, the next hour I was much more on my toes because yeah. it was just, you know, oh, what's going to happen after yep. that? How are yep. they going to respond? Yep. Also a little bit surprised that Vic didn't lean into it a little bit. I understand everything that he's saying, and I know you got to, you know, cooler heads prevail and all that, but, you know, I've heard quite a few coaches, at least college coaches over the years say, you know, I'm okay with my team getting in a fight every now and then as long as it's, you know, not crossing that line and they broke it up quick and – I don't know. I'm just I mean, okay with it. That, that's what Dan Campbell, I mean, who's the ultimate football dudes dude, <laughs> said when his team got in a fight. Yeah. Was he, he liked it. He, he wanted that passion and Vic, nothing with that. So when they were both on the ground and I didn't see any punching or anything going on when they were on the ground, they got kind of broken up. And, and when they were brought up, they were broken up just by like, you know, there are three or four teammates in between them with a lot of guys gathered around. And then Bradley kind of went through some teammates mm -hmm. and and shoved Garrett Bowles. And, I mean, a pretty hard push, about as hard of a push as you can get. And then, of course, that set everyone off again. But instead of going after each other like other teammates going after each other, they kind of just stayed. Okay, Bradley, you stay away. Garrett, you stay away. And I thought it was done. And they both went their way, still chirping at each other a ton. But I thought the, the, the fight was over until about five minutes later. Bradley Chubb is standing on the right sideline. Garrett Bowles is on the other sideline. Bradley starts walking behind the play, starts walking across the field to Garrett, which is something you don't see after like a couple minutes after a fight. Typically, you know, guys can still be very upset, but typically they've cooled down. And Bradley's still screaming at him. And you have some coaches. You have Lauren Landau, who's just absolutely ripped. But still, <laughs> he's not, you know, 270-pound Bradley Chubb. Gets in between them, separates them, makes Bradley go back. Garrett and Bradley are just still jawing at each other uh, from across the field. Bradley starts reenacting on the sideline what happened. And according to what I saw, I was only about 10 yards away from, from Chubb. Chubb. You know, Garrett was starting to, you know, kick him and stuff. Uh, and then they went down on the ground. So who knows? That's how Bradley, I think, saw it. But then Garrett's still just furious on the sideline. He gets sent into the locker room, not by Vic. So he wasn't kicked out of practice, but sent into the locker room by some other coaches just, that just thought he had to calm down. He goes in there. Then you have assistant offensive line coach Chris Cooper follow him a couple minutes later. Then you have Ray Jackson, who's very close with all the players, go into the locker room. And then you have George Payton go into the locker room mid-practice. I personally have never seen that happen before where a general manager goes into a locker room to talk to a player for a fight that just happened. And then about 10 minutes later, all three of them, George Payton, Ray Jackson, and, Bra er, and, and Garrett Bowles all come back onto the field together. And Garrett, a little more calmed down. Uh, and and that, that's kind of when the chirping stopped. And I think Garrett got the message. You need to calm down, buddy. Well, I mean, when the GM comes into the locker room, it's, it's one of those situations where you kind of got to reevaluate it. It reminds right. me of, you know, if there was a, a fight in middle school, for instance, let's, you mm -hmm. know, it's one thing if your friend group, the guys that were around you when the whole fight broke out are like, all right, calm down. You're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's another thing when the principal comes right. in and he pulls right. you aside and, you know, makes you reflect on your actions. Hey, like, do you think this was the right situation? Did you handle it well? You know, what could you have done differently? And again, you know, I... Fights are going to happen. It's mm -hmm. a contact sport. It's not the end of the world. I like the way that the rest of the team responded. Like you said, nobody yeah. you know, came in, but that's interesting that George Payton went into the locker room. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in that <laughs> locker room and just kind of <laughs> yes. hear what he was saying. Like, is he mad at him? Is he just, you know, playing the father figure type right. role? You know, hey, you know, we like the fight, we like that, but let's watch it a little bit. I don't know. There's a lot of different ways he could have gone with that. Yeah, there, there is. I imagine just from knowing George Payton a little bit that he took on more of the father role. I can't imagine he went there and started screaming at him. Maybe that's what Chris Cooper did. But I, I wouldn't have been in any screaming mood around Garrett Bowles just because I had never seen two guys that upset at each other for that long. When I've seen fights in the past, guys are really upset. Uh, you know, Emmanuel Sanders and Chris Harris Jr. going at it many years ago. They were both really upset, both jawing at each other for a couple of minutes. But I never saw Emmanuel go and try to attack Chris five minutes later or anything like that, like I saw today. But Brett Chubb came out, or, or uh, Bowles came out of the locker room and gave it about five more minutes and then went across the field calmly, no screaming, and, uh, you know, shook Bradley's hand. 
gave him a little tap on the shoulder, and then all was good from there. But I did not see the two go up against each other the rest of practice, which was probably very smart on Mike Munchak and Vic Fangio to make sure that that did not happen. Garrett Bowles got out there the rest of practice. He was going up against Malik Reed. Uh, and Bradley Chubb, I think he was kind of done for the day because he's still on a pitch count of how much he's going out there and playing every single day during team period. But today... A fantastic day for Bradley Chubb because in the few reps he gets, he beats Barrett, Garrett Bowles so bad that it causes Garrett to, uh, to f- from from what Bradley's perspective, to to lash out on him. You know, Garrett did say, you know, a couple of years ago, he he considers the quarterback like his, you know, wife or, or whatever, yeah. you know, and he get he's gonna get a little bit upset if you're yeah. beating him, and it kind of yeah. seems like that's what happened. You know, mm-hmm. he just maybe his frustration got the best of him and. That's okay. You know, I want my tackle to have that type of mentality. Yeah. But I like that he was able to come back out. He was able to finish the practice. All these reps are valuable. It's just a weird situation altogether. Encouraging a little bit, right? I mean, this defense, the pass rush, everybody is hoping that Bradley Chubb and Von Miller are going to come back and, you know, really perform at a high level. And the fact that, you know, Bradley Chubb was able to consistently burn Garrett a couple of times, especially coming off that injury, that's encouraging to me. Mm-hmm. I will say, you know, no pads, so it's one of those. It's kind of really hard to evaluate the stuff in the trenches, but mm-hmm. weird day, fun day. Good yes. to see some fights. Yes, it, good to see some fights. And you brought up so, some good points there that made me think this was probably the best case scenario for the Broncos' first fight of training camp. A, no one got hurt. B, it was relatively small. There, there, there weren't punches actually being thrown. You know, we're not having to follow up to see if one of their hands are broken yeah. from punching a helmet or anything. It was a small tussle that was on the ground. Then they got broken up. There was one push involved. The whole team wasn't involved, so there's not much to follow up on and check up on. But there was tempers raised, which is good to see. We needed that. Uh, and now it's out of the way. We'll see if anything happens. But it's also probably good that this got out of the way before Minnesota because that's when you really don't want to fight to break out because then that can turn dirty when it's team against team, not just like an an offense versus defense sort of thing. So I'm happy it's out of the way, and it's good to see that that there's passion out there. You know, get that fight out of the way now. You know, those, those shared reps against Minnesota, obviously things can get nastier in a scenario like you said, but even beyond that, you know, they're... They're trying to figure out their starting quarterback, and you know that's the last thing they need, I think, in those joint practices is yeah. time wasted, reps wasted, any of that type of thing. So, you know, like we said, we're not trying to sit here and glorify it because you know it, it could go bad, and ultimately, you know, team camaraderie. You want the chemistry to be on point. You want everybody to come together. But five years of losing. <laughs> even worse than losing. I mean, the, these last couple of years, they haven't even really been putting up any fight. Right. I know that the fans are sick of it. It mm-hmm. seems like the players are sick of it too. Yeah. And because of that, you know, like we can live with this, right? Yeah. I mean, nobody got hurt. Yeah. Broke it up quickly. And 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 I said this yesterday when talking about Jerry Judy and his first drop of training camp being yesterday. And you don't want to see that, but he went seven straight days without a drop. That's very encouraging. Today, Garrett Bowles had his worst day uh, at, at, during this training camp. He has not been beat. From, from Bradley Chubb or from Von Miller. Now, again, limited reps going up against Bradley Chubb, so he's typically been going up against backups on that side. But for the eighth day that he's going up against Von Miller, Malik Reed, Bradley Chubb, that this is the first day that he's gotten beat consistently a couple times in a row, you, you'll you'll take that, you know? Oh, totally. And, and it, now, that doesn't live up to his standards that he set last year when he wasn't getting beat once every eight games. It was even more than I mean, it was even less than that. But still, it, you like to see that he's still doing really well, and that takes over a week into camp for him to be beat by, you know, all pro pro bowlers. And then you also like to see that Bradley Chubb, in his limited reps, is starting to maximize those. Because Cortland Sutton, we were talking about it earlier this week, kind of off to a slow start to camp, and then Wednesday, he shows us that, okay, look, I'm still coming back, but I still have that Pro Bowl form in me. Bradley Chubb, he's still coming back. We didn't expect him to come out of the gate super hot, but you do want to see flashes, and today we saw those flashes. Absolutely. I mean, we got the flashes from Chubb, and, you know, you mentioned Cortland Sutton. I I know we're going to dive into some of the other stuff later in the episode, but he had two really impressive catches today. One of them diving back corner of the end zone. The ball was not put anywhere near where it should have been put. I don't remember if it was Bridgewater or not, but that just made me think of him. But I don't know. Garrett Bowles, like you said, he's been really consistent. 
And that's kind of the, the mindset that the great ones have, right? You know, when they right. have bad performances, it bothers them. Mm-hmm. We want that from Garrett. He he expects to be that all pro tackle that we all, you know, can't, became used to seeing last season. He didn't live up to that today and it put him in right. a bad mood. You know, that's how I, that's how I want my tackle to be. <laughs> yep. Yep. You mess with my, my quarterback. It's like messing with my wife as exactly. you said a couple of years ago. All right, Justin, before we hit a quick break, I want to get to some questions here in the first segment. And I see one coming in from Ron Pablo. He says, Zach, will media be allowed at the stadium practice tomorrow? Yes. Tomorrow is going to be kind of the, the Broncos scrimmage of training camp, which they typically have once a year. It's going to be in the afternoon, starts at 1 p.m. And this is kind of to get the guys, especially the new guys, used to what it's like to be in the stadium. And then also it's going to be ran like a normal uh, scrimmage. So you're going to get to see Teddy versus Drew a little bit. It's going to be more realistic where if they pick up a first down, they get to continue and see how they do. So that's going to be a great evaluation of these quarterbacks and that will be tomorrow we're going to I'm going to be there and we're also going to have a post pod practice so make sure you tune into that and Justin it's going to be the first time that we've had Sunday Broncos football this year it feels so good man I was out just this entire week I've been thinking about how excited I am for the season and I mean you know RK texted me a couple days and asked me if I wanted to fill in I was like you know what sure I've got CSU camp all next week might as well get in some Broncos while I can but I mean, last year was the first was the first NFL season since I was six years old that I didn't get to attend at least one game in person. Mm. And, you know, I, I've been very fortunate. You know, I, I understand that. I was very privileged in that regard growing up. But last year, it just didn't feel the same, you know? Mm. Like, I know you guys got to be there, and you guys, in, on a limited basis, not even, you know, all the media got to be there yep. like normal. But we're, we're finally getting back in the groove of things. And there's nothing more normal, at least in my life, then Broncos football on Sundays starting tomorrow, we get a yep. little taste of that. And then we're right into preseason. It gets, it just doesn't get better than this. Yeah, no, it, it really doesn't. Allie, any more uh, questions in this first segment that we can get to right now? Mm, now you were at practice today. Did anyone jump out to you? Not necessarily at practice, but what, what how would you answer this? Warren Jackson? I so desperately wanted to be Warren. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's my guy. I, I can't I can't in good conscience come up and be like, he really showed out today because he just he you know, I didn't see a whole lot from him. Yeah. Made it a couple of plays. You know, the guy who actually surprised me a little bit, Kendall Hinton's making some plays at wide receiver. Mm-hmm. He's getting open. It it wouldn't shock me if he between what he brings from special teams and just that option as like a fourth, fifth type receiver, I could see Kendall Hinton making the roster. Well, I love that you notice him because he's someone who's consistently flashed in training camp after just dominating OTAs and really being the guy that everyone was picking to be their sleeper this year and to make the 53. I like that you notice that in in today's practice because that's what he's been doing every single day as a wide receiver uh, and then also in special teams. He's right there with Trinity Benson in terms of he's he's. They've overtaken Tyree Cleveland and Seth Williams, in my opinion, in terms of making the roster because of what they bring. So I, I absolutely love that. And we'll get we'll get to some more questions in just a second. But first, I got to tell you guys about becoming a member at DNVR because now is the time to become a member. And in fact, tonight is the time to come down to the bar. We're going to have UFC 265 on tonight. So make sure to get down here. And if you're a member, Justin, you get free or you get extra raffle tickets. All you have to do is when you're here, make sure to tell us that you're a member and you will get free or extra raffle tickets. And also have your fantasy drafts here at the bar and I'll tell you what where else would you do it oh there's no the, and, and then here here here's an even better perk and reason to do it once you're here and you bring a group of 10 friends to have it you'll receive two free pitchers I couldn't believe this when I heard this deal you'll get one Breck Bick, Breck beer a pitcher of your choice and then also you'll get another pitcher and so here's what you do make sure to email GM at the DNVR bar to set it up and we'll be here from 3 p.m. till eight, till the rest of the night and then you will get that deal hooked up what a cool way to do a fantasy draft here at the bar with free beer I mean between the the deal we're doing with the gift card and you know giving away money there the fantasy deals mm-hmm. I mean if you're not a DMVR member at this point I'd 
I question your sports passion. <laughs> I mean, like, this is the spot. Mm-hmm. Football season is here. Fantasy football is here. I'm coming off of a tough, tough championship loss. We're absolutely having our draft here. I mean, I yep. like I said, there's just no better spot for football fans. Yep. No, there, there, there really isn't. So make sure you become a member with us and sign up right now with our training camp promo. Sign up for fifty nine eighty eight, and you'll get a sixty dollar gift card to the DNVR locker. It doesn't get any better than that. I don't know who approved that deal, but it's it's killer. <laughs> absolutely killer. It is killer. And something else that's killer is the Breck brew that you receive when you're at the bar for your fantasy draft. You get a pitcher of your choice, and I will tell you what, you, you just can't go wrong with, with whatever you get, the mango mosaic, strawberry sky, hot peak. You can't go wrong. And so maybe you bring 20 friends, and you get four free pitchers, and you try out every Breck brew that we have here, except we actually have more than that on tap. <laughs> you can't go wrong with any beer at Breckenridge Brewery, and you certainly can't go wrong with a member Breck beer here at DNVR, which is 22-ounce beer for the price of 16 ounces the deals they're endless man yeah they really are speaking of breck i'm just coming off of a week of breck drinking in the mountains mm. it was great but it wasn't a member beer you know you know what i'm saying like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's great out of the can i'm sipping creekside it's perfect oh that's pretty good it could have been a little just more perfect if it would have been a member beer with all my friends around me for <laughs> our fantasy football draft yep, exactly and uh, speaking of deals i mean we just keep throwing deals your way check out our friends over at manscaped right now to get that summer bod going and continuing to go we've got the manscaped has the best best products that you can need including the lawnmower 4.0 i may have whipped it out this week to do some manscaping myself and it's the best no nicks no cuts you get the light which just shows everything that you need to possibly see it's waterproof which is so clutch and also what's clutch is using the code dnvr over at manscaped.com to get 20 percent off plus free shipping and they have way more than just the amazing lawnmower 4.0 they've got the crop reserver which is a ball deodorant the crop reviver which is a toner the performance boxer briefs they even have body wash and shampoo so make sure to check them out in anything that you get Use the code DNVR to get 20% off and free shipping. Well, Justin, there was more than just a fight today. And uh, I love that you were there today to kind of get a fresh perspective on this quarterback battle. And I thought today was interesting from the quarterbacks, but I want to know what your perspective was from Drew and Teddy today. I thought Teddy was the more consistently accurate quarterback, especially when it came to live reps. I think he, you know, I was, I was a little concerned going in, especially after hearing what RK said yesterday and, you know, talking about how he was consistently behind everyone. I think you made some of those points as well. Yep. I felt like he, for the most part was fairly on point today, at least, you know, when it came to the live reps, he had the best throw of the day on that post route to Noah Fant. It was like a 70 yard touchdown. Yep. Went about 50 yards on the air, hit him in a rope, hit him perfectly in stride. It seemed like he commanded the line of scrimmage. But then again, you know, he did make the best throw, but there was also just so much, like, dump offs, you know, five yards from the line of scrimmage. It just, it wasn't very exciting. Yep. But I, I do think he commanded the team better. I thought he he performed a little bit more consistently. Drew Locke, to me, started slower. You know, in seven on sevens, it really seemed like he was overthinking things, mm-hmm. was taking six, seven seconds at a time to get rid of the ball. That's obviously never ideal. You're going to get sacked in those scenarios. He missed a couple of guys. I thought he recovered well, you know, finished strong down the end. Mm -hmm. But if we're saying, you know, who won the day, I'm probably leaning towards Teddy. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, I, I am as well. I think Teddy won today, and Justin, you, you, you nailed it. Now, I was on note-keeping today, so I took down every single play, and you nailed it just about Teddy being accurate. He was not good yesterday just in terms of accuracy he and drew were both so far off their receivers drew they both took a step up today drew was still a little more inaccurate than teddy still had a couple of balls where one of them was like where was he even throwing to and it wasn't a throw away it was in the middle of the field that may have been outside of an interception the worst throw of camp but outside of a couple of those he was better than he was yesterday but teddy and team and seven on seven guess how many times the ball hit the ground The entire day for Teddy. Twice? Once. Only once. And it was a Noah Fant drop. 
Just on, on a little pass yeah. in the right flat. Hit Noah's hands. Should have absolutely been caught. So Teddy was money. And at the beginning of camp, we were talking about this type of day from Teddy where nothing spectacular, especially during team drills, because team drills, he didn't really go deep like he did yesterday. That's it. That 70-yard bomb was during 7-on-7, seven seven, which we'll give him credit for, but not as much credit if it was during Agreed. team. Yeah. Uh, but this is what he was doing to start camp. I think three of the first four days, he had days where he only had one ball hit the ground and today he does that again this is a day that coaches are going to look at and say we can win with this especially a defensive coach is going to say he's not turning the ball over which neither quarterback did today which was very important after they both did yesterday uh and he's a guy that's just gonna pick up five yards at a time and in fact i think during a seven on seven period where teddy didn't miss a throw he had like six straight completions for five yards each and uh, it's not sexy It's not exciting. It's not going to get, you know, on ESPN or red zone at all. But the coaches view that as, holy cow, we're averaging five yards per play, six in a row. Well, we're in field goal range now. Uh, we, we, We can just keep going with this. That's how we win. So Teddy won the day. He was accurate. Nothing spectacular. Uh, he, in my notes, he had did have a sack during team period. Mm-hmm. Uh, he held on to the ball too long. Drew, I had him down for three sacks today. Really, the two of those sacks negated pretty substantial plays. But it, I mean, it wasn't even close. They, they were blowing the whistle before he even threw the ball. Uh, and now both guys did finish strong. And, and I like that you pointed out that Drew Locke started really slow. And then he he did heat up. I wouldn't even say heat up. He did better he at got the, to, at you the know, end of what practice. What you would at least expect, you know, early right. early it was like, man, Teddy's gonna run away with this day. Right. Drew at least did enough to where it's all right. You know, this was a this was a good day. We made some progress here with the offense. But you know, if I'm the coaches, even beyond the the accuracy and, and Teddy, like we said, he was on the money today. It's just that decisiveness. I mean. You wrote about Drew being, you know, the gun-shy gunslinger. Right. That's what I saw today. I just see a guy who's thinking too much, and I wonder, especially if Teddy, you know, continues to rack up these practices where he looks more decisive, he's hitting his throws, he's not turning it over, if Drew's just getting in his own head at this point, and, you know, at that point, I'm not sure we're going to ever be able to see, you know, the best of him, you know, the the highest Drew Lock ceiling is is out there using his arm. It's stretching the field. Right. He's got to make smarter decisions than he did last year, but it right. just kind of seems like he's somewhere in between now, and, and that's not a good place to be for a quarterback. He's not Drew Lock, and he's not Teddy Bridgewater. He's just somewhere in the middle. Right, and it just is a bummer because when those deep plays are there, not necessarily today, but in the past 10 days, he's thinking about it. And then once he's thought about it, he either realizes it's too late to throw it deep uh, and he just kind of throws it out of bounds or he just finds a check down. Yeah. It, it, and it just seems like that's what's happening more and more. I know someone was getting really upset with me on Twitter last night saying that I was saying Drew is afraid to throw it. He's he's hesitant to make mistakes is what it really seems like. And actually, Vic was asked about that after practice today. And Vic said, I might see that. I might not see that. So he saw that. Which to me, yeah, that's what that says. Vic could have easily denied that. But he said, I'm not sure if I see that from Drew about being hesitant to not make mistakes. And I think that's interesting. Unfortunately, that's not the way Drew wins this job. You know, we, we need Drew to go out. And if he's going to win this job, interceptions aren't the worst thing in the world if they're limited. If he if he's going out there and getting three touchdowns to one interception... That's fine. You'll live with that. You'll live with 36 touchdowns to 12 interceptions. What you won't live with is 16 touchdowns to 15 interceptions like last year. But let's say he goes out and throws 45 touchdowns to 15 interceptions. Okay, now we're talking. Even if it's 30 touchdowns to 15 interceptions, you would say there's something to work with there. We're not going and moving on in a different direction. We're going to give Drew one more year to see if it can be 30 and 8 or 32 and 12, something like that. But if Drew's going out there and he's going, you know, zero touchdowns, zero interceptions, and Teddy's going out there and doing one touchdown, no interceptions, with this ridiculous, like, 95 completion percentage in some practices, it's going to be an easy decision. I think you nailed it right on the head there. I mean, look, I I don't foresee a scenario in which Teddy Bridgewater starts and throws double-digit interceptions. I just... 
I don't see him doing that. He's not that type of quarterback. I also don't see a situation where he goes out and throws 30 touchdown passes. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like if if you're just if you're going to go with a guy who's going to be safe, you might as well just play Bridgewater because he's better at it. If if Locke's going to win the win this gig, it's got to be because he can do things that Bridgewater can't. Mhm. Obviously, the decision making it needs to be better, but I I think you're spot on there. You can live with interceptions, especially in the modern game. Fifteen passing interceptions in 2021 isn't like fifteen interceptions in 2000. Everything is you know everything revolves around stretching the field and going deep and taking advantage of these new rules that favor the wide receivers. But because of that, naturally you're going to turn the ball over a little bit. Mahomes every now and then throws one where it's like all right, you know probably. Probably shouldn't have thrown it, but you understand why he does it because he has the skill set. Right. Locke has, you know, that type of big arm. It's just, I don't know, man. He's He's got to get out of his own head a little bit. Yeah. I, I, I'm i glad that he's being conscientious of not turning the football over, mm-hmm. but at some point you just got to go out and do your thing. And you're 100% right. And maybe uh, a big time for him to do that is against the Vikings in joint practices this Wednesday and Thursday and then in the preseason game. And if he does it then and he comes out and he shows, look, what I've been doing these past two weeks is working on what I'm not good at. And that is recognizing when there's a check down and then taking those check downs. And then he comes out during the practices and games and is showing that and he's throwing the ball deep when it's there and he's checking it down when he's there. Then we'll be talking about a guy three to one touchdown to interception ratio, at least two to one touchdown to interception ratio, which will be fantastic to see because Justin, the best thing for the Broncos is Drew Locke to pan out. Is Drew Locke not to just win this quarterback competition, but to show that he's the guy for the future and you don't need to give up three first round picks to get Aaron Rodgers for two to three years next year. You don't need to mortgage the future to go from number 12 in the draft to number one in the draft to get your guy. You just have your guy and we don't have to talk about quarterbacks. So there's no question that that's the best thing for the Broncos, but he has to show that. And a lot of people are saying in my comments, because they don't like seeing this. They don't like seeing the reporting about Drew checking the ball down a lot. They're saying, what if he's just practicing what he's not good at? Well, at what point do you start practicing how you want to play? And I get some some practices going out there and just working on what you're bad at. Yeah, You probably don't do that five practices in a row, right? You eventually, especially in a quarterback competition, you want to show the court, the, the, the coaches who you truly are, right? So at what point does this change? And if it doesn't change in a week from now, when we have the first preseason game, which starts literally in three minutes in, in three minutes and one week from now, then I don't think that's who you are. I think then you've changed yourself to being someone else. And my counter to those people, you know, tweeting at you would be, it'd be one thing if this was all live team reps. We're seeing that indecisiveness come into play in seven on sevens as well. That's a good point. There's no pass rush. Right. He's still sitting like, you know, and I know this is not great for the people listening. If you're watching, you know, you can see him where he's kind of clutching a little bit with the football and it's like, oh, I wanted to, oh, now it's too late. Yeah. And he looks over here and oh, now it's too late to go there. All of a sudden it's been six, seven seconds and the coaches are blown and dead. Yep. Again, like I'm not saying there's no logic in what these people are commenting, but I think it's somewhat flawed and not necessarily looking at the whole scope of things. Yeah, and I, th- I think that's a fantastic point. And in seven-on-sevens, Drew was more accurate than he was in the team period, uh, but despite the couple of uh, incompletions he had, the biggest problem that I had was the one sack that he took in seven-on-sevens. Yeah. That's It's a passing drill. In high school, you shouldn't be taking Throw sacks it away. for that. Exactly. Show that. Um, so let's. I, I want to talk about the final red zone period. Okay. The but and it was the the way that they wrapped up practice today. And typically, that's the most important period is the one at the end of practice where it's either move the ball or they do a red zone drill. And today, I think from my perspective, they were starting at like the three yard line. That's what it, it like. Yeah, three or four. They were really yeah. close to the end zone. And uh, Drew got two passes, and Teddy got two passes. Drew was up first and they alternated. The first one from Drew, he tried to sling it in somewhere in like the right middle of the end zone and Alexander Johnson broke it up. I didn't have the best view of it. Did you see, was there an opening there? Uh, Did did Alexander, because from what I saw, it just seemed like Alexander Johnson was kind of all over it. Yeah, I I, I don't know if the timing was off on that one or what, but it was one of those, I was like, as soon as he was like, oh, I I thought the linebacker was going to come away with an easy pick there. Right. 
I don't maybe maybe there was an angle like I said I was kind of far back so it was it was tough to see that one but I cringed when I saw that one you know what like I would have loved to have gotten a replay on it so that I right. could have seen you know maybe maybe there was a receiver in the back that I just couldn't see yep but it just kind of looked like he was forcing things again yeah. I mean you know I just criticized him for being indecisive at least he was decisive in that decision oh, but right. i think it was decisively the wrong decision yeah. yeah and then the next play uh was something that you kind of want to see from drew if he's going to be indecisive and it's what we saw from teddy so teddy i believe it was off of, of just a quick fake handoff in the gun he needs to buy time so he kind of steps up and moves around in the pocket mm-hmm. he didn't just sit in the pocket waiting for the pass rush to get him had a pump fake which bought open a little bit of time for Jerry Judy to get open in the back of the end zone, kind of the middle of the end zone. He threw it in there, a dart for him, not a Drew dart by any means because uh, Teddy doesn't have that type of arm strength, but got it in for the touchdown. Really liked how Teddy manipulated the pocket. I think that's perfect. I mean, that's what you have to be able to do, especially, you know, in the modern game, the, the best quarterbacks in the league right now. It's not necessarily being the most mobile, although, you know, having Lamar Jackson's skill set is obviously a benefit, but, you know, it's guys like Tom Brady being able to step to the left, step up, make a quick throw. But beyond that, it's you got to step up and then put the football where it needs to be. Bridgewater, no, he doesn't have a lock arm, but that's what he did all day today. He just put the football where it needs to be. And if you do that consistently, you're going to win the job. Right, right, exactly. And then the next play, I know RK gives Pat Shermer a lot of uh, criticism all the time, but one thing I will say about this next play when Drew Locke was up was it was it was a great play for Drew. It really helped him calm down, although it was at the end of practice, but it was a great play because it gave him only two options and then a third option to run. What it was was Drew started in shotgun, and then it was a quick rollout to the left. Seth Williams in the slot mm-hmm. immediately just yeah. went into the, the, the flat, and I believe Drew may have had another option somewhere in the middle or the left of the end zone kind of further back, uh, but Seth Williams wide open, Drew dumps it to him. Seth Williams turns up three yards. Touchdown. What I really like about that is Drew Locke is the more athletic of the two quarterbacks for the Broncos. Drew Locke can turn that upfield and take it into the end zone for three yards if there's a defender on Seth Williams. He can make a very easy pass to him, or he can probably stretch open another read for another one. And what do we know about Drew? Last year, he was really good off play action. He was really good when he was moving. Don't just let him stand in the pocket. We're we still seeing it during this training camp where Drew... It just seems like he wants to move. He's more comfortable moving. That's that's when he is more decisive is when he's moving, and he's still there right now in that progression of him becoming uh, an all-around quarterback. When he still needs that help, give him that help. And Pat Shermer did it on that play, and it resulted in a touchdown. That was Drew's final pass of the practice, and it ended with the touchdown. It ended on a high note. Good coaches scheme to their players' best skills. Mm-hmm. I can't speak for Drew Locke. Based on what I've seen, it seems to me kind of like what you're saying is that he's more comfortable on the move. Maybe he thinks a little bit less, you know, maybe standing in the pocket, it's just too many things going on. Maybe it just allows him to go out and kind of play a little bit more. Whatever it is, I don't know, but he is more successful off play action. He has a big arm. You want to be able to run the ball well. It just seems like this is something they should be trying to set up consistently. One, because Drew's good at it. But two, because it's going to put your offense in the best like position to contend. Right. I I just want to see more of it. Get him out there. Let him move a little bit. Let him run every now and then. You know, yep. just get it. Get him moving and and get him not thinking. Right. Yep. Exactly. And, and that feels weird to say that for the quarterback because you know so many times with guys like quarterbacks, they have to be the smartest guy on the field. They do. But you can overthink, and I just I I think Drew's kind of in that spot right now. Yeah. I mean, Drew. It naturally is a gunslinger. He called himself that two years ago. He called himself that last year. This just a, less than a week ago, he said he's a calculated gunslinger. And I think that's a great way to think about himself. However, 
calculated kind of makes me think maybe things are are he he's trying to process too much yeah. at once right now and instead it's kind of just overwhelming right now so i like that pat Shermer set himself up for for or set drew up for success there so i, I think we're on the same page of what we saw at broncos practice today and i like that you had a fresh perspective and and still saw the things that i did now it's just another day teddy slight 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 win yesterday didn't really deserve it necessarily uh, j- just because he didn't run away with it. Today, I'm going with, uh, you know, a-, a-, a win for Teddy. You'll have to check out the quarterback scoreboard to see exactly where it was. But I like that Teddy is now bouncing out uh, and-, and doing well. Again, very accurate today. Uh, Allie, before we get out of here, any more questions for us? Yeah, so we have here one from Jules saying 2021 UDFA with biggest realistic chances to get a roster spot. Mm, I mean, we just talked about Warren Jackson. Uh, a- anyone else that jumps out to you? Maybe, and this might be a little bit of a long shot, but, and, and maybe I'm being a little too biased here, but, you know, Adam Prentice at fullback potentially, he's going to have to be able to display a versatility that, you know, is on special teams. He's going to have to be able to make tackles. He's going to have to block, but he's he's put a couple of linebackers on their butts throughout the yes, week. He has. And, you know, it wouldn't shock me. He's a guy that he's just one of those people that when you're around him, he has this aura, like coaches just love him. He, he's got biceps for days. He's a massive dude, deceptively good athlete. I'll, I'll throw his name into the conversation. Why not? Yeah, I, I like that. And uh, I'll tell you what, he is built different than Andrew Beck. Andrew Beck, fullback, tight end, hybrid. But Adam Prentice, when he's out there, he's like an old school fullback. I think it was yesterday or the day before he laid someone out. He he's He's that bruiser. I think he'll end up on the practice squad. Uh, which, which is impressive for an undrafted fullback. Oh, especially. I mean, he's he's not a guy that got a ton of reps at, at Colorado State or um, Arc or South Carolina when it comes to actually running the ball. But I don't. He was like Mike Fo- Mike Bobo's second favorite player on the team. I mean, the only person he liked more was Colin Hill, and that dude was like his son. So <laughs> I'm I'm rooting for Adam Prentice. I think it would be fun to see. And I don't know. I I just I like the thought of having an old school fullback, somebody that can come in and. You know, especially in red zone situations, how many times have we seen Denver get stuffed on, you know, third and one, third and two over the last couple of years? Yeah. Maybe an Adam Prentice is what they need. Yeah, maybe. I'll give you a couple other names. Cornerback Mac McCain. He's done really well. Continues to make plays. He's undrafted out of North Carolina A and T. Now it's very, very hard to make the roster at the quarter cornerback position. But another practice squad guy. He's done enough to certainly earn that. And then kind of a slowly building fan favorite Andre Mintz. He's an outside linebacker, mm-hmm. number ninety-one, undrafted from Vanderbilt. He's made some plays. He certainly earned himself a spot on the practice squad you just wonder with Jonathan Cooper kind of progressing and showing that that he can be that fourth outside linebacker for the Broncos where these spots are for these guys I think that's the tough thing whether you know you're looking at corner or wide receiver linebacker a lot of these you know we like a lot of these guys but they're in position rooms that are fairly deep you know especially defensive back it's going to be an uphill battle But sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, you just got to stick around a little bit. And, you know, Shaq Barrett had to be on the practice squad for a year. Right. Then he ended up, you know, going on to be one of the best pass rushers in pro football. (laughs) Sometimes you just got to be patient and buy your time. And hopefully that's the case with a lot of these dudes. Unsurprisingly, we've talked about, what, three or four CSU Rams in this in this pod who would have thought we get plenty of buffs coverage with everyone in this freaking company (laughs) bleeding black and gold there are almost (laughs) equal amount of rams people in this company than there are buffs the buffs are are just a bit louder (laughs) i was gonna say you she she can mute your mic (laughs) you i can go on Rudo did go to CSU technically, Eric went to but he, CSU. Doesn't, he doesn't even claim it, so I can't. I mean, but still, we might be louder. Buffs fans might be a little louder, but there is equal, I'm pretty equal for Rams and Buffs in this company. I just got to say. That's fair. We do We do a good job. I'll say this. There's not an outlet in the state that will give you as much consistent college coverage as what you'll get here at DNVR between our CSU true. 
and CU coverage. So a little flex yeah. for the audience. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And Allie, do we have one more? Yes, we have one more question here. Um, Supreme Donkey says, how do you feel about Fangio giving out so many off days, especially after they've been lackadaisical and haven't had energy? Mm, it's a good question. I don't mind it for the vets that are getting it. I mean, today you did have another off day. You had Justin Simmons getting his first vet day. You had Von Miller getting another vet day. Um, and you had Bobby Massey getting a vet day, which to me is that was a little surprising. kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, do they just want to announce that he's won the starting job? And if not, what's he doing taking a vet day? I don't think I would do that if I was in a competition for my job, but maybe he just feels that comfortable with it. And right now, I would say that's probably the way it's leaning is Bobby Massey's going to be the Broncos starting right tackle. Calvin Anderson absolutely making the roster as the swing tackle. Just a little interesting. I think that may, may be the Broncos tipping their hand at what's going to happen at right tackle. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, if, if he wasn't at least the projected starter, and obviously things could change, he could go out and completely lay an egg over the next couple of months and they, they flip where their heads are at. But I think you're right. I think at this point that pretty much seals the deal with him being you know, <laughs> yeah. the starting right tackle. As far as you know, vet days as a whole, I don't have an issue with it. I mean, when you hear from these veterans around the league who talk about it being beneficial for them and them feeling like they're still able to compete at the same level but they're fresher... I'm going to take their word for it. You right. know what I mean? Like who, who better else to trust than these players. And it, it seems to be the direction that the league is kind of heading is just prioritizing rest and trying to limit contact again. I don't know. I mean, I understand that football, you know, in like the eighties and nineties, two a days and they walked everywhere uphill and <laughs> it was always a hundred degrees or zero degrees. I get it. Like life was tougher back then. But <laughs> I don't know. I, I I'm okay with it. I, I want it. I want Vaughn on the field. And if giving him a couple of days off in camp is going to help lead to that, I'm absolutely fine with it. Yeah, and these are these are outside of Bobby. I mean, these are all guys that very much know their position and, and their role on the team. So it doesn't bother me. But a good question and good questions all around in this live format. Thank you all so much for joining us on this live side. We're going to hop over to the podcast side. If you want to listen to the rest of this, make sure to just, just look up Broncos. Wherever you find podcasts will be the first one that pops up. And before you get out of here on the live side, please hit us with a thumbs up, subscribe, and turn on alerts so you know when we're going live after one of these practices. Again, we'll be coming to you, to you tomorrow around 4 p.m. hour. So again, that's why you want to subscribe. That's why you want to turn on alerts just so you can get the update from post-scrimmage tomorrow. Justin, thank you so much for joining me. Let's jump into the podcast side of things. 